Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is James Lin. I'm an assistant professor of Taiwan studies at the University of Washington. Uh, today we're very honored to have a book talk by Professor Julia Strauss on her new book, State Formation in China and Taiwan. For those of you who are new to our book lecture series, I wanted to give just a brief background about what our program does and a little bit of a preview of our upcoming events. So the Taiwan Studies program promotes research and education on Taiwan society, history, and culture. We have a number of public programs, uh, quite a few slated for this year. Uh, some of you might have seen that we have recorded all of our videos during these pandemic times. They're all up on our website under video archive, as well as on our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe. We have a link at the end. Uh, just a, a few upcoming events and videos. Um, just last week, we had a roundtable with Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang, and that video has been recorded. It will be going up uh, hopefully very soon, perhaps the next week or two. Uh, we're very excited to be able to talk about uh, digital governance and the public sphere beyond COVID-19. We also have a few more live events coming up. Uh, just next week, we have a conference, post the post-pandemic world and global studies education in Asia, and there, Professor Jeff Ho will be presenting on behalf of the Taiwan Studies Program. We have a lecture in Chinese by Professor Xu Xueji, who is the director of the Institute of Taiwan History at Academia Sinica. She'll be talking about the current status and development of Taiwan history. Uh, that'll be in a couple of weeks from now. We'll also have a very exciting new special speaker series hosted by Dr. Wen Yanzhu, who is also one of our Taiwan Studies faculty, and she'll be hosting this series on environmental issues in Taiwan, hosting a number of scholars uh, based in Taiwan discussing contemporary environmental issues. Our final event of the academic year is our final book talk. Uh, we're very excited to welcome uh, Professor Dominic Young discussing his new book, The Great Exodus from China, Trauma, Identity, and Memory in Modern Taiwan, and this is about the uh, Wai Shenlin, Exodus, uh, 1949. We also have a number of new courses that will be offered in the upcoming year. Um, I'll be teaching in the spring my History of Modern Taiwan course. We have a new course called Taiwan's Transitional Democracy, Politics, Business, and Civil Society. There will be more information coming about that in the coming weeks. And I'll be teaching my graduate seminar, Making Modern Taiwan, again in the fall. Uh, finally, we have, uh, as I've been announcing, uh, our World Congress of Taiwan Studies, which is a big event for us, uh, is delayed a year, but we are very excited to have that coming up in June 2022. And uh, we also are very happy to announce that we have a, uh, a gift from the Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This is just recent news. And so we'll be using that gift to uh, build a new arts and culture program. So if you'd like to uh, learn more, please visit us on our website at uh, jsys.uw.edu slash Taiwan. You can also follow us on our social media, so YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We'd like to give our thanks to the Zhang Jingguo Foundation and the Taiwan Studies Project of the Ministry of Education for supporting this book talk series. Uh, and if you'd like to support us to allow for more programming as well, please visit our website. We have a donate page where you can give and support the program. Okay. Uh, now, I'd like to now introduce Professor Julie Strauss. Um, I recently read about uh, Professor Ezra Vogel's passing, and one of the, the more um, interesting things that I read about him was that instead of giving the, the usual kind of description of uh, the extensive CV of, of his guests at Harvard, he would instead offer an anecdote about uh, the guest that came. So I, instead of, of talking about Julie Strauss's uh, immense accomplishments, I'll, I think I'll offer a, a, an anecdote instead, and I hope that would be okay for, for Professor Strauss. Um, I first met Professor Strauss uh, as a graduate student, actually, and this was uh, at the Association for Asian Studies conference many years ago. I think it might have been in Seattle. I'd emailed her because I was working on land reform in Taiwan. I'm still working on it. And I heard that she was working on that and this eventually what came out to be this book that she's talking about today. And she was very kind to uh, spend quite a bit of her time with me. We were just talking about land reform, um, about how important it was to study land reform from 
a bottom-up perspective. And we're talking about the different archives, local archives that kind of illuminated what manner form in Taiwan looked like. And um, I very much appreciate, as just as a graduate student, to be able to talk to someone as senior and as accomplished as Professor Strauss. Um, so I'd like to welcome Professor uh, Julius Strauss, uh, Professor of Chinese Comparative Politics at SOAS, University of London, author of many books, um, including uh, Strong Institutions and Weak Polity, State Building and Republic in China, 1927-1940, edited volume, The History of the People's Republic of China, past editor of the China Quarterly. Um, and today she'll be talking about her new book, State Formation in China and Taiwan, Bureaucracy, Campaign and Performance, published by Cambridge University Press uh, 2020. So without further ado, uh, please go ahead, Professor Strauss. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Remember, I can't see myself, so is, is everything going through okay? Yeah, looks I'll good. take that to be a yes, okay. So um, I was very pleased uh, to get this uh, invitation to uh, a Taiwan Studies audience, but I also have to confess that uh, this is a little bit of a fraud because in fact, the book and what I'll be talking about today is, uh, is actually comparative. It's state formation in China and Taiwan. And uh, given uh, the extraordinary events in uh, Washington, D.C. just yesterday uh, that has had us all riveted uh, to uh, the, the, the performance and uh, incredibly bad performance in some ways of uh, a whole range of different actors in our own political establishment, I found myself utterly unable to restrain myself from putting in some extra images uh, to indicate this question of the question of performance in politics more generally. All right, so state formation in China, Taiwan, bureaucratic campaign and performative modalities of policy implementation in the early 1950s. So this was a very, very years overdue book that finally came out um, a little more than a year ago. And uh, it's animated by a, a basic question, which I have up here in my first slide, in terms of building the Chinese state. In the Chinese Civil War uh, of 45 to 49, we have a deeply unexpected outcome in 1949-50, which was the emergence of two Chinese regimes that became uh, two Chinese states, vastly unequal in scale with quite different governments, the People's Republic of China, PRC, for the vast majority of the territory of China, and a much shrunken, indeed rump, Republic of China, now exiled to a relatively small island that had only very recently been reincorporated back into China, um, only a few years before, three years and a couple of months uh, before, plus a few offshore islands, give or take a few. Now, we had this very unexpected outcome, uh, this, this real anomaly, if you will, in terms of civil war and the civil war being artificially interrupted uh, by the sudden and unexpected outbreak of the Korean War in June, late June of 1950. And yet, <clears throat> By the mid-1950s, both were well-consolidated and unusually successful exemplars of both revolutionary and conservative authoritarian regimes. So obviously the revolutionary one is the People's Republic of China and the conservative, quote unquote, one is the Republic of China, Taiwan. And we know that this became, we know that this is so because this is what our history tells us and it's taken as a given. But there actually is surprisingly little on how this became so. Because if you look back to what people were actually writing in the late 40s and very early 1950s, in 1949, 1950, absolutely nobody imagined that the Revolutionary People's Republic of China, the conservative ROC Taiwan, would become, if you will, exemplars of their regime types. And so there's actually very little on how this became so. And what I mean by this is the mechanisms and the strategies that underlaid each and the ways in which there was movement over time from what I call a set of surprisingly shared similarities to increasingly distinct differences. And that leads me to my next slide. 
Um, so why a comparative focus on state building in the PRC, where I focus in particular on the Sunan region and the ROC, Taiwan? Well, this, this is a slide where I have to justify why I do something so weird, because very few people actually do anything this weird. In the realm of post-World War II new states, relatively few opportunities to engage in deep comparison with states that hold culture and structure constant. Um, you could look at North and South Korea, but you can't get access to much on North Korea. You could also look at North and South Vietnam. These are also candidates. And I would expect that in the next generation, especially as Vietnam becomes more open and there's more archival access, that we will begin to see uh, our colleagues in Southeast Asian history and Vietnamese history also begin to engage in this sort of comparative work. There's a methodological issue of incommensurate size. It goes something like this, PRC, big, Taiwan, small. And my way of getting around this question of incommensurate size is to shrink down the size of the People's Republic of China to focus on one region. And the region that I pick is Sunan, the wealthy and developed region around Shanghai, um, including Shanghai, the districts, which were then counties around Shanghai. And then insofar as I was able to get information, uh, all of the Sunan counties, it wasn't until 1953 that Sunan and Subei, which had been uh, previously separate administrations, were combined to create the province of Jiangsu. Uh, so Sunan was a comparator for Taiwan on the grounds that both were relatively well developed for the time, both had some industry, both had a surprising amount of infrastructure investment, both had already undergone very substantial movement out of subsistence agriculture. And here's the real reason for the comparison. Despite the enormous mutual hostility and the political claims of being utterly, utterly different, made by both uh, leaderships in both the ROC Taiwan and the PRC, there were, in fact, very substantial overlaps in structure, assumptions, and indeed in state building agendas in 1949. So I take these this set of point of similarities as a baseline and say, okay, we start with something that actually looks very, very similar in a lot of respects that have been overlooked. And yet by the mid 1950s, not only do we have two regimes that are uh, well consolidated and indeed exemplars of the regime types, but they are rapidly accelerating in terms of their differences from each other. They're clearly on different trajectories. Okay. so. In the next slide, where I have structural conditions and normative assumptions, this is just a quick tick list. Okay, so these are the structural conditions and normative assumptions shared by the PRC and ROC Taiwan in 1949. And then as a little check, are these com common in developing states more generally? So regional insecurity and heavy militarization. Yes, yes. Outsider aspiration to reassert central control shared by RO PRC and Sunan and ROC Taiwan, yes. Common in developing states, also yes. Monocratic party state, yes. Common developing states, eh, variable. High modernist commitment to science and development, definitely for PRC and ROC, variable in developing states more generally. Presumption of the amenability of citizens to state instruction rather than simple coercion, yes, and I would say no more generally for common developing states. The state to play an important role in, in, in ensuring subsistence and a modicum of social justice. Yes and no. Deep suspicion of all associational activity not overseen by the state. Yes and no. And desire to impose order, vision, and to communicate norms rapidly to a subject population. Yes, and I would argue, Variables. So you can see that from Jump Street, if you will, from 1949, there's a great deal that both the PRC and the ROC Taiwan have in common in terms of the structural conditions under which they're working, as well as their normative assumptions about what they should be doing. But states are not static. This is a kind of static topology in uh, this, this list.
And so states aren't static. They implement and they perform policies. They have preferences and choices that they then attempt to implement in terms of policy. And I suggest that the ways in which they attempt to implement preferences and choices are performed in ways that transmit regime norms, that persuade populations, and that at least attempt to build regime legitimacy. So policy implementation is never just about getting a policy implemented and through. It's also about reinforcing core regime or state norms and in an early period of regime consolidation, as was the case in the early 1950s in Sunan in the PRC and in Taiwan for the ROC. It was also very, very deeply implicated with, in fact, building the state. Um, so in the case of the PRC in Sunan and the ROC in Taiwan, policies were not implemented neutrally. They were implemented through a shifting mix of bureau, what I call bureaucratic and campaign modalities that were per performed in contrasting registers. Broadly speaking, the register of public emotional mobilization in the case of the PRC in Sunan versus procedural rectitude and austerity uh, for the ROC Taiwan. So what do I mean by bureaucratic and campaign modalities of policy implementation? Now, this is an ideal type, and there's always some degree of bleed between bureaucracy and campaign. But as ideal topologies, the bureaucratic is modality of policy implementation is hierarchical. It re relies on regular ongoing rulemaking based on precedent, typically. It is by definition depersonalized and delimited. So <clears throat> the individual can be separated from the office that he or she inhabits. This is one of the reasons why record keeping and precedent is so important. And the bureaucratic, I would argue, simplifies complex realities through the disaggregation of complex holes into standardized categories that can be sliced, diced, monitored, recorded. The campaign, on the other hand, um, shifts back and forth between hierarchy and egalitarian participation. It in contrast to the bureaucratic, which relies on regularity, on ongoing rulemaking, unprecedented, the campaign by definition is extraordinary. And it is extraordinary in terms of its short-term mobilization of resources, sometimes those resources and materials, sometimes they're human, to accomplish a fixed and set goal or set of goals. Uh, the campaign in contradistinction to the uh, to the bureaucratic, it mobilizes normative and emotional commitments. Uh, and one set of campaign norms often bleeds into other campaigns. Uh, and in contrast to the bureaucratic modality of policy implementation, it simplifies, but it simplifies the complex through disaggregating the whole into standardized categories that can then be recorded and monitored. The campaign simplifies, but it simplifies in a different way. The campaign simplifies through fusion, through compression, and through the deployment of narrative, uh, narrative holes. So instead of disaggregating, it, the campaign fuses. So fundamentally different approaches towards uh, simplifying complex realities. They both simplify, but they simplify in very different ways. All right. Now, <clears throat> today... I'm going to be largely talking not so much about, <clears throat> about land reform, but about the question of regime insecurity, uh, security insecurity. And as campaigns of terror, as a strategy, a deliberate strategy deployed for regime consolidation and state formation. So why the focus on regime insecurity? First, because domestic security is the single most important precondition for regime consolidation. We also, in, in fact, we know that one of the major reasons why uh, the Republic of China between 27, 1927 and 1949 was so fraught 
was because it never completely established domestic security over the vast territory of China. Uh, and it took the, and the Kuomintang took this lesson to heart when it was forcibly removed uh, or removed itself to uh, Taiwan in the very late 40s and early 50s. So domestic security, absolutely uh, the most important precondition for regime consolidation. And in the early 1950s, domestic insecurity was also framed by regional insecurity, particularly regional insecurity through the outbreak of the Korean War. And it is absolutely the case that there certainly were some spies, some subversives, and some sympathizers working to undermine each of these regimes from within. What is equally beyond question is that both the PRC in Sunan and the ROC in Taiwan both explicitly and deliberately resorted to campaigns of terror against real and imagined domestic enemies to consolidate the state. So uh, how was this prosecuted? On to the next slide. So I have this nice little contrast between the main way in which um, the campaign against putative subversion uh, from within was implemented in the PRC in Sunan in the early 1950s. And this was prosecuted, implemented through uh, a campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries that got going in principle in late 1950, more or less coterminous with uh, the People's Republic of China's uh, entrance into uh, the Korean War. Uh, and it reached its peak in Sunan uh, in the in April, May, June, July, the late spring and the early summer of 1951, uh, that then um, went quiet and then came back with another Sufan campaign to clean up counter-revolutionaries in the autumn of 1955. And then it widened yet further with later campaigns against rightists in 1957 and, and beyond. There was another Sufan campaign in the early 1960s, and this goes beyond really what I'm studying or talking about today, but a uh, campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries in PRC in Sunan. The biggie, the important one, late 1950, but its peak in the spring and the summer of <clears throat> in Sunan of 1951. Now, what you had in contrast in Taiwan under martial law is something that's difficult to even talk about because there isn't an equivalent term. Now this period is called the period of white terror or a kombu. Uh, it could be more or less coterminous with the early stages of martial law. Um, I date it from autumn, the autumn of 1949, which was the point at which decent records started to be kept. Um, within uh, marsh, within the larger strictures of martial law. And what you see are absolutely campaign bursts of enforcement against real and imagined, uh, um, let's see, English term, a pan manza, people engaging in uh, seditious or presumptively seditious activities. So it gets going in autumn of 1949. It intensifies dramatically in late 1949 throughout 1950 uh, with various ups and downs. And then there's a rapid drop off in 1954, 1955. And you see relatively little uh, in terms of these dramatic bursts of enforcement after 1954, certainly in terms of things like execution rates. There are sort of you know, reminders in 1960 and at various other points when people begin to uh, become a little bit too liberal for the likes of the regime. But the big bursts of enforcement start in late 1949. And the, the, the peak of this is probably 1950 uh, and 51 and 52. And then there's a little, a little upsurge in 1953. And then it rapidly drops off uh, in 1954 with very, very few cases being brought after this. So we have the beginnings of uh, these bursts, these campaign bursts, 
uh, even though it's not called campaign in the case of Taiwan, uh, in the early 1950s. And it's clearly and intimately wrapped up with regime consolidation. So this brings us to the next question of numbers, namely, okay, what was the scale of this? Now, this gets tricky. We do have good numbers for Greater Shanghai. We do know that in 1951, 14,391 counter-revolutionaries were sentenced, an exact 0.24% of a population of roughly 6 million, and an almost even 20% of those were executed. We know now that this was because of quota. Um, whereas in Taiwan, the, uh, the arrest rate seems to have been lower at we, this gets a little tricky because I did my own calculations of this and my own estimate, and it's a very conservative estimate, and it's likely an undercount of 11,672. I can tell you I came up with these figures later. Rebels, quote unquote, Panmanja, were sentenced at roughly 0.14% of a population of roughly 8 million. And here's where it gets tricky. Execution rates varied from zero to 57% per anjian or case. So people weren't brought in as individuals, they were brought in and, and prosecuted in Taiwan as part of anjian or cases. And then an anjian could be very small, only one person, or it could be very large, it could be 20, it could be 30, it could be 80. Uh, and so one sees wildly differential execution rates from zero to 57% um, within the early 1950s, the more serious of the cases, again, averaging somewhere around 20% uh, execution rates, but um, very, very unclear and random. Now, in terms of the targets, this is where it gets very interesting. In the People's Republic of China, only half of the people who were arrested and executed only about half were political counter-revolutionaries. The other half were real or potential social or economic uh, competitors or the kinds of people that the party state wanted to get rid of under a basic law and order campaign. So they were local bullies. They were the lumpen hanging out on the street, hassling passersby. They were the leaders of counter-revolutionary sects. They were people who in many cases would be just charged with average crime, like smuggling, as opposed to counter-revolutionary crime. And uh, it's pretty clear that at least half uh, of the people who were sentenced were just people that the regime considered to be social undesirables or potential or real social or political competitors rather than being political competitors in any way. In the case of the white terror in this early period, we know that far, far, far many more people were sentenced and indeed executed than there were members of the Chinese Communist Party in Taiwan. There are different numbers um, that have been thrown around to indicate likely numbers of the of common of card carrying Communist Party members in Taiwan in say 1949 or 1950. One uh, interview suggested that oh it was around 2,000. Most of the written records that I've seen have suggested around 1,000. Um, but whether 2,000 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. Many, many, many more people were sentenced then there were members of the Communist Party in Taiwan, and others were soldiers suspected of different factional loyalties, fellow travelers, independence-minded Taiwanese, and many people who were just unfortunate, uh, having been seen hanging out with the, the, with the wrong, reading the wrong kind of magazine by the wrong person at the wrong time. All right, now, on to the next slide, the instrumentality of these campaigns of terror in both places extended state reach. In the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries in China, this was a way to get rid of political and economic competitors and social undesirables. In the white terror and under martial law, identical, way to get rid of political and economic competitors and social undesirables. The campaign, both 
were a means to extend the power of the party state into large factories through the extension and the creation of uh, security organizations, uh, the enforcing the compliance of private actors. In the case of martial law, we see an extraordinary number of ROC security organizations in surveillance, in networks of informers, in special detachments, in paramilitary being set up at this time. And in both, one had a presumption of guilt. In both cases, there was bait and switch uh, for the accused. So that those were some of the broad similarities and, and they were significant in terms of extending the reach of the state and in many of the, um, uh, in many of uh, the kinds of um, measures that were taken. But the way in which this was done was really very different. And we can see this in terms of preparing the public and in terms of official propaganda. So <clears throat> in the case of the PRC in Sunan, you had lengthy propaganda preparing the public. Uh, and you can see through uh, uh, this is humorous. This shines the flashlight of, uh, of the military worker peasant against the evil counter-revolutionary who has blood dripping from his knife as he's trying to sneak away. He's wearing vaguely Western clothes. He's lost his shoe. Um, he's um, a, a thoroughly despicable uh, semi-Western figure wearing semi-Western clothes, readily relatable. Whereas in Taiwan, uh, the Guomindang official propaganda was pretty much limited to posting the rules and the occasional public posting in black and white of terse statements of who had been arrested, who they were, their age, their county of origin, uh, and their official position in the Communist Party sometimes. So very, very different kinds of official propaganda, one which is colorful, it's humorous, it engages in movement, and the other which is literally flat, black and white, uh, two-dimensional. When you see the way in which these campaigns were performed, not only were they performed in different ways, they needed to be seen to be performed in different ways. So in the PRC and Sunan, you see this as an openly, joyously affirmed campaign of class struggle, viscerally casting out the evil counter-revolutionaries beyond the pale. Whereas in Taiwan, you had a quite dubious set of claims to legality because legality was whatever martial law said it was gonna be at any given point in time. But much was made of procedure and there was denial of scale um, it was only, you know, the, the, the bad people who, who were, you know, going to be basically sequestered and whisked away. In the PRC in Sunan, you had rapid, sharp strikes in public. In the ROC in Taiwan, you had rapid, literally sharp strikes in secret. Uh, there was a midnight knock on your door, knock, knock, knock. Security police came in and you were hauled away. Um, in the in the dead of light uh, in the dead of night, no one knew what the hell had happened to you. In the PRC in Sunan, the campaign was performed to be dramatic, to be emotional, and to bring in the public. In Taiwan, it was procedural. It was sequestered. It was not for public com uh, consumption at all, much less public participation. It was about procedural order and uh, legal rectitude. So, and my next um, slide, which basically condenses several chapters worth of work into one slide, more or less. We have the C CP in Sunan in red, and we have the Kuomintang in Taiwan in blue. So we're color-coded here. Performing terror, participatory campaign versus concealed process or procedure. So, the form or the type of performance was really very different in Sunan versus Taiwan. In Sunan, it was the Kong Su Hui, the public accusation meeting, sometimes also called the Dou Zhong Hui. In Taiwan, it was the martial law sentencing hearing. 
the animating how of the performance in Sunan was through the Gao Chao, a high tide of emotion uh, through a whipped up crowd. In Taiwan, it was through the reiteration and the reiteration and the reiteration of a reified notion of legality where state decisions made at least in principle by impersonally applied legal rules. In terms of the players and the staging in Sunan, we have pre-coached victims engaging in dramatic mian dui mian, face-to-face -face accusation in public space outside for maximum public consumption. In Taiwan, the accused, the judge, and the military regards were all inside the prison. No public access at all. And the audience in Sunan was the masses. The whole point of the Kung Su Hui or the Dou Zhong Hui was to have the masses or the Chun Zhong merge with both each other and the state, what the state wanted in getting rid of evil counter-revolutionaries. And in Taiwan, it was really quite different. As near as I can tell, the audience, the main audience for these um, sentencing hearings in Taiwan was the state itself. The state seemed to need to reassure itself that it was doing things legally and correctly with lots and lots of documentation with order and rules, the order and rules in many cases, particularly in the early 1950s were entirely bogus and they were just being made up. But somehow it was still important to go through the process and the public and even the relatives of the accused were only an audience at several removes from the prison itself. So if we move on to my next slide, we have two images here. Now in Sunan, this is a public accusation meeting of um, a counter-revolutionary. We are not sure exactly where it is. We know that it was not in Shanghai because it was a part of the propaganda in the immediate wake of the, the sweeps uh, of counter-revolutionaries in late April of 1951 in Shanghai. So these photographs of a public accusation meeting had clearly been taken before uh, the very end of April 1951. My own guess is that they were probably taken somewhere in Sube, um, probably in March-ish, I'm guessing, of 1951. Uh, and you can see a number of things that are immediately obvious. The first is that the crowd is so large. Uh, the first is that it's outside and not inside. The second is that the crowd is so large that even from the stage, the photographer cannot take in the whole crowd. Um, there are other um, angles uh, in, the, in, a, in this sequence uh, from this accusation session, which gives you different camera angles on this particular event. But it's outside. The accuser is in motion. She's waving her arm. Um, you don't really see it here, but other camera angles show that the crowd is so large that she has to be holding a microphone. Um, and you can see just about that the people holding the counter-revolutionary, the poor old counter-revolutionary, who's about to get it in the neck, is uh, the balding guy here. And he's being held by two um, military guys. And you can just about make out a rope uh, that is literally around the guy's neck. So that when the charges are read out and the cadre who's on the stage off to the side reads, you know, shouts, drop to your knees. If the guy doesn't drop to his knees, he's garroted and he's choked. And so he drops to his knees. So this is a performance explicitly calculated to rile up the crowd. Whereas in Taiwan, there aren't very many uh, examples and photographs of these sentencing hearings in the public domain, but this is one of them. And the first thing that you notice is that uh, it's inside. It's inside and in a quite small makeshift space. So here it is the accused that is on stage to be shouted at by the crowd. Whereas in Taiwan, in the sentencing hearing, it's the other way around. It's in a small enclosed space. There's a velvet curtain um, 
behind that suggests that uh, this is probably a makeshift division of a larger space also inside. And you can see a desk to the far right left, I'm uh, sorry, far, far right of uh, the frame on the right. Uh, and you can see that it's the judge that's on the stage, not the accused who's on the stage. So the judge is literally leaning, looking down on into the dock. And you've got um, several accused. This is the, uh, uh, th this is the trial the sentencing hearing of a, an actually a very important one of a guy, a military general by the name of Wu Shi and his courier right here. And you can see that what is going on is that the this military guy is leaning over Wu Shi to make sure that Wu Shi is signing and acknowledging each one of the charges with, and he's holding um he's holding a a a, a bee a, a a brush to acknowledge uh yes yes acknowledge 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 so the staging of this is very different the setting of these. Uh, trials of subversives, very, very different. The result is going to be the same. They're going to be shot. That's what's going to happen. But the staging, the audience, um, the purpose of uh, these trials in both cases is really a, a, a point of real contrast. So we need to ask ourselves, why the insistence on such different performances? And I suspect that the reason for this is that the how is needed to be publicly performed to demonstrate regime norms and to lay down public claims to regime legitimacy and to educate the population into regime expectations and norms. And regime expectations and norms are really very different in the new revolutionary PRC and the reconstituting conservative quote unquote ROC now in Taiwan. In the PRC, the goal was to forge new bonds, new social bonds via popular mobilization and public support for new revolutionary China. Whereas in the ROC Taiwan, the goal was to literally break apart old social bonds through a process of atomization. <clears throat> so Forging new social bonds, breaking apart old ones, very, very different. And the results of these different performances ended up being both similar and different. So in both, the, the point number one, to dispatch to find enemies of the state and then some, and to scare the hell out of their friends and family was done in both places. So in both, terror was very effective. Uh, terror was also, these campaigns of terror were also very effective at removing um, the impure, quote unquote. But in Sunan, the impure were put on public display. And in Taiwan, the impure were sequestered behind the walls of the prison. In the PRC in Sunan, what was being performed was a public and dramatic breakpoint in the revolution a moment of no return, a demonstration, a popular revolution, or at least semi-popular revolution, people being brought into the revolution. In Taiwan, what was being demonstrated was new state-imposed legality to abide by and shut up about. In the PRC in Sunan, this was about the instruction of new publics into a new, new set of state determined categories about popular participation, as well as garnering po popular complicity in the state's violence against designated enemies. In Taiwan, it was a warning to publics to comply with new state law, whatever new state law might be, and to atomize individual families and to keep people scared. Now, when we move to establishing templates, um, the, perhaps the most significant effect of these campaigns in the early years of the 1950s was the way in which each laid down 
um, templates for the future. The People's Republic of China was repeating a successful set of repertoires and lessons learned by the Chinese Communist Party in North China of popular mobilization and public merging behind state chosen targets and state chosen scapegoats. And the problem with this was that after you got past the early 1950s and got into the mid late 1950s, the problem was that deep attachment to this repertoire could only be turned inward once the usual suspects had been rounded up and dispatched. And by 1953-54, all of the usual suspects had been rounded up and dispatched. So later campaigns using the same repertoires with, could only have vaguer targets with these techniques now being applied and performances now being applied within the confines of the work unit rather than out there in public space until we get to the Cultural Revolution when it becomes quite public yet again. In Taiwan, the opposite lessons had been learned. In the early 1950s, what one saw in all winks of the party state in Taiwan was the repudiation of the kinds of compromises and factionalism and co-optation that had that, that had been felt to have led to such failure in China itself. And so by God, we're in Taiwan now and we're going to do it right. And this led to an extraordinary concentration in political will to launch highly effective, but I would also what but I would argue also highly delimited campaigns with much more le minimal legitimating performances of legality and process that required obedience, but much less from the population in terms of demonstrations of loyalty that required more and more and more and more of people over time. So by way of conclusion or sort of part of sort of conclusion, um, even when they're not explicitly recognized as such, I would suggest that bureaucratic and campaign modalities are features of a very wide range of state systems, and that the nexus between bureaucratic and campaign modalities is a quite variable one. Campaigns need the infrastructure and the coherence that only bureaucracy can provide. Uh, and under conditions of state building, they may very well lead to state expansion. Uh, and if you want to ask me about land reform and the ways in which this led to state expansion in both uh, in both Taiwan and the PRC in the early 1950s, ask those questions in Q&A. But the problem is, if taken to their logical conclusion, campaigns undercut bureaucracy, and not only in China or Taiwan. So if we look a couple of years ago at Turkey's campaign to get rid of the country of Gülenists in civil service and the judiciary, well, who the hell knew what a Gülenist was? A Gülenist was, it was like the anti-rights campaign. A Gülenist was whoever was being accused of being a Gülenist. And as we think a little further about performance, the young PRC celebrated a very particular constellation of participatory campaign public performance with a very clear script and a very clear purpose. Um, but performance features very prominently in other political environments, both authoritarian and democratic. And so I would suggest that maybe we need to think a little bit about who the protagonists in the performance are. What are the institutions and expectations that the performance is embedded in? How does the performance either support or undercut the state? What are the signals that the performance sends? So in the ROC Taiwan, I would argue there were definitely performances, but their performances in terms of uh, getting rid of Panlanza were sequestered behind opaque walls and any kind of public counter performances were quashed. They were never allowed to get off the ground in the first place. Now, I'm going to conclude, um, perhaps strangely, with some reflections on campaign, bureaucracy, and <clears throat> performance uh, by referring to uh, something I've not been able to get out of my mind, and I suspect many of us have not been able to get out of our minds, looking at these horrific images of what's gone on in Washington, D.C. Uh, over the last 36 or so hours. And here is almost a classic textbook case of how 
performance campaign and bureaucracy were all on display in some very horrific, but also very analytically interesting ways. So this first image is of the mall with classic campaign mobilization. We've got Trump 2020. We've got large masses of people gathering. This is classic campaign mobilization. How did those people get there? They didn't just come there. They were mobilized. Uh, maybe they mobilized themselves and organized themselves. Maybe they had help from above. We're not really sure about any of this, but clearly this was not spontaneous. This was a campaign, an extraordinary event, an extraordinary march. And then what one sees, if we look at the next uh, image of, um, depending on how you want to frame this, protesters or um, subversives, perhaps, or insurrectionists, perhaps, a literal performative assault on bureaucracy, rules, and procedure. Why? Because not only were protesters storming uh, the seat of the legislature, combined house, they were storming a uh, entirely ceremonial bureaucratic procedure in which there was really very limited room for much in the way of theatrics. There were a few theatrics here and there about contesting the result, but there were strict limits put on how much the electors, uh, the electoral votes could or could not be challenged. And so this was literally a performative assault on bureaucracy, on rules, on procedure. And we see here um, the combination of campaign and performance. I mean, you have to kind of wonder, okay, where is their reality? Where is their not reality? Did these people really think, did the people in this campaign, did they realize that what they were doing, um, that this campaign was a performance? Uh, did they realize that this wasn't going to work? Did, this, did they realize that the police would eventually come in and eject them? Um, hard to know, hard to know about motivation, hard to know what people did and did not realize. We have in the next uh, image, occupation as the symbolic visual overturning of regularly ordered space behind the lectern. I think this was a, behind the lectern of the Senate. And then finally, my favorite, a performance that negates the bureaucratic through props, through costume, and through gesture. Um, so we have a photo op here of an insurrectionist who has a flag, uh, props, costume of informality, of boots, of jeans. I'm surprised he's not, he doesn't have a MAGA cap, but he doesn't have a MAGA red cap. Leaning back in a, a position of ease rather than formal procedure. Formal procedure, the bureaucratic, the office. It's the takeover of the office. So performance is everywhere. But I think maybe we might want to think about ways in which different kinds of performances are directed to different kinds of ends, interacting with bureaucracy and campaign in very, very different ways, both as part of state building, as was the case in Taiwan and Sunan in the early 1950s, or a charge to attempt state unraveling. Uh, as we saw just yesterday. And I will leave it right there and stop sharing. At least I hope, I hope I've stopped sharing. Yeah. yeah, you're good. Thank you okay. so much, Professor Strauss. That was a very uh, informative, very interesting talk. And the conclusion was wonderful to tie it up to contemporary events. Um, so I'd like to give this opportunity for the audience to ask questions, uh, feel free to use the chat slash comment section uh, on whatever platform you're using, either YouTube or Facebook, and we will see those questions. Okay. Uh, we have 
a couple already, so I'll go ahead. Are, and are you going to monitor, James? Because I can't see anything. I will monitor. Don't okay, worry. Great, I'm, great, I'm great. Great. I'll take notes. Um, so the first question is, what is your observation of the possibility of a state formation of a Republic of Taiwan? Mm. We've also put up the question on screen, so that's there for you. Okay, to, I can't uh, quite see it. Of So uh, state formation of Republic of Taiwan? Yes. Okay. Um, do we want to take these sequentially or, or do we want to group them? We have, it seems like we have some time, so we can- we Okay, can go let, so let me respond to that one at least. We'll take them one at a time for at least a little while. Um, I think we want to distinguish between state and regime or state and government. Um, the state is, uh, the state may very well be there in terms of its institutions, its apparatus, uh, its, um, its civil servants, its military and so forth. Um, and so one can have a change in regime or a change in government as indeed one has had in Taiwan for some time now in terms of change of government between uh, KMT and DPP, kind of back and forth now for quite some time. So one can have a change in government without uh, a change in state. One can have a quite well-formed state that has either a change in government or even a change in regime. I would argue that in the early 1950s, one had really state formation in the case of the People's Republic of China, because basically they got rid of, they got, basically they tried to get rid of everything as quickly as they could, and then they built from the ground up. And in the case of Taiwan, what one had was a weak, very weakly held, um, very deeply illegitimate provincial level government that was then in effect, um, overwhelmed and taken over by mainland refugees. And the fundamental, many of the fundamental institutions of the state were then grafted, grafted on. Uh, and in many cases, um, the fundamental compact with, for example, the countryside in terms of how things were done were fundamentally reorganized and rejigged. So I would call this, um, if not state formation, then certainly, uh, uh, state, state acceleration, perhaps. Uh, so if we think even hypothetically about any kind of Republic of Taiwan, um, I would argue that the state is there already, no matter what you call it. It has its own, it has local governments, it has civil service, it has infrastructure, it has a functioning military, it has um, de facto all of the things that you, you normally associate with a state, except for broad-based international recognition. Um, and it's kind of gotten along more or less okay without these things, more or less, you know, give or take. This is, this is something that can be argued. So um, would one need, so if, and these are two hypotheticals, if there were a Republic of Taiwan that were declared tomorrow, and if the People's Republic of China did not uh, decide that this was completely unacceptable and institute some kind of blockade, um, which are two big counterfactual ifs, um, what would state formation look like? And my answer to that is that basically the state is there no matter what it's called. I don't know if that helps. Great, I think that was a that was a great answer, Professor. Um, next question: uh, Do you think the visibility of history is enough to push people for a less authoritarian government from the bottom up, or do you think there needs to be a top down change combined with a bottom up change for that to happen in China? Um. Well. People prognosticate about the People's Republic of China at their peril. Uh, a little bit earlier this evening, I finished having to completely redo the second part of a lecture for my undergraduates, where I had to discuss uh, 
lay out the basic structure of the People's Republic of China and then say, you know, 10 years ago when I gave the comparable lecture, these are the things that I would have said. And I talked about institutionalization and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And since Xi Jinping has come in, uh, in the last eight years, we, we, one didn't know about it immediately eight years ago. One got more of a sense of it maybe six years ago, and certainly in the last three to four years. Um, a lot of what we thought was irreversible in the People's Republic of China turned out to not be irreversible. So um, at this point, it's very, very difficult to imagine um, bottom-up change because the party state is doing, in, in the People's Republic of China, because the party state is doing such a thorough job of making sure that does not happen. Uh, from ideological control to, you know, monitoring web chats to, you know, social responsibility compacts to all, you know, you name it, as to incarceration of, you know, parts of the population, uh, carrot classic carrot and stick and a set of surveillance tools that was unimaginable even 10 years ago. Okay. In most democratic transitions, it tends to be a comp democratic transitions tend to come about as an interplay between something, some sort of crisis, overwhelming the authoritarian leadership so that, or enough of the government splits and enough of the military and domestic security pillars of the regime are no longer reliable because they sympathize with either the crisis or demonstrations from below. So typically with regime change, it's, it's um, a combination of push from below often due to demonstrations and, and some way in which the government is not handling some kind of crisis in combination with some degree of defection or wavering from above, or it, it, from people who are part of the above. Now, the degree to which that is lasting and of more than the moment remains to be seen. So in many of the so-called color revolutions, which in my, to my mind weren't revolutions at all. They were regime change, but not revolutions. After the immediate push uh, to get out a particular authoritarian leader or party, um, you've got, may, maybe you had new elections, maybe you had new a new set of people come in, but how much bottom-up change was there in terms of institutions and in terms of civil service and in terms of the state not clear in, in, in many of these cases. So in my view, it's always a combination of the two, but just because you get regime change, authoritarian regime change, doesn't necessarily mean any kind of lasting democratization. Um, you could simply be replacing um, one set of authoritarian leaders with uh, a group of people who come in seemingly seeming to be very democratic at the outset, but um, in five years' time, looking very much like the old people. Uh, so it's, I suspect the, although questions of democratic transition and democratization is not my particular field of inquiry, uh, and many people work on this and are much, much, uh, more, uh, more, uh, better equipped to answer this question than I. Uh, it seems to me that it's always a combination, but it's a uh, a necessary but not sufficient um, set of conditions for uh, real democratization and lasting um, some something that is lasting institutionally. Thank you, Professor. Uh We've got a lot more questions that's come in, in the past few minutes. Uh, so I will, uh, I'll still go one by one, but we'll see if as we get to near the end, we still have quite a bit of time, we've got 25 minutes. Um, 
I'll see if we need to speed it up. But for now, still one by one. Okay. This is a question from Professor David Bachman. Um, he wanted to ask, uh, in the Taiwan case, what is the purpose of a performance behind closed doors? What is being performed and to whom? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's something that I've wondered myself because uh, there was no public that was allowed. As near as I can tell, these were performances put on by the state for consumption by the state. And I suspect that it has something to do with the way in which um, the, the ROC state under martial law rules staked its entire legitimacy on notions of legality. Now, the fact of the matter is that legality in the early 1950s was whatever martial law and the executive declared law to be at any given point in time. There were regulations, but it, in fact, these rules and these regulations were so broad, and in some cases, they were so internally contradictory that you could have driven large trucks through some of these regulations in terms of process. But what you see is that over time, um, martial law and the rules came to mean more over, over time. And the martial law judges, for reasons I cannot quite understand, but they, they really seem to care about upholding procedure. So we know, for example, that political prisoners became very, very, from memoirs, became very, very adept at communicating amongst themselves as to what they needed to argue um, in terms of proof and lack of proof and in terms of confession and what you didn't want to confess and what the state could and couldn't do to you based on the proofs that they did and did not have. Now, sometimes this, um, this uh, folklore of prisoner folklore was wrong and you could be executed anyway, but a lot of the time it was right. And what one sees over time is that in fact, the rules came to mean uh, more and more. And so it seems to me that these were performances of legality put on by the state for the state to assure itself that its own legal procedures matter, um, which is, it's, it sounds very self-referential and a little bit strange, but as near as I can tell, that was the audience. The audience seems to have been the state itself. And it, the state was legitimating itself by, okay, look what great procedures we have. Um, these are the charges. This is when it was read out. These were the documents. This is the confession. Uh, and here we're going to, you know, tie it up with a, with a red bow and we're going to file it now. Um, and meticulous record keeping. I mean, a lot of the charges were bogus, but boy, did they, they, they kept really extensive records on, on sort of everything. So why did this matter? Because if the state were going to claim to the rest of the country that they were about order, rectitude, here are the rules, we're posting the rules, um, here are the rules you need to abide by, here, you know, and, and excessive, like uh, this, this mania about rules and posting the rules and law and how law is sacrosanct and so forth and so on. They needed to believe it themselves. And because they needed to believe it themselves, um, they needed to perform it and to make it real. And increasingly over the course of the 1950s, it does become more real. It does become more meaningful. So that's a kind of long-winded way of saying, I am not entirely sure, but if you can't if you can't convince yourself, you can't convince a restive and sullen population that most of which hates you. Uh, and if you're going to post the rules, you 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 got to believe in them. They've got to mean something over time. Yeah, thank you. I I also remember reading your book. Um, something I didn't think about before, but that. 
there is an issue of creating a loyal bureaucracy. We have to think about the state as, as more than just this abstract entity. It's constitutive of individuals who right. are co into it. And so I think that um, just knowing the size of the ROC government relative to the population in Taiwan, there's a significant amount of people living in Taiwan who are actually a part of the state and that these rules are also performed for yes. bureaucracy as well. And I think that's a strong point in the book. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next question, uh, also related to Professor Bachman's question. This is a question. Uh, thank you, Professor Strauss, for the terrific talk. I'm very keen to read your book. Uh, were any of the white terror executions in Taiwan carried out publicly, specifically those carried out in Ma Changding in Taipei? No, they were not. Now, this didn't mean that they that people didn't get glimpses. They did. Um, but this was felt to be a huge embarrassment. No, they um they're no, now the, the main killing ground in Taipei at Matsandi um was known. It was whispered about. Um people would occasionally sort of get wind of prisoners in trucks being sent off to the execution ground. People knew what was going on, but um, this was sequestered as much as possible. The regime um, learned and learned quickly to keep this under wraps as much as possible. So very early on in the white terror, if I'm remembering it rightly, there were a few examples of um, executions um, that were public enough and visible enough that people got very, very upset. And, and there was immediate sympathy for uh, the victims. And the regime decided that you could not have this and that it needed, it needed to be... Um, kept quiet. It needed to be sequestered. And so <clears throat> very, very quickly, they moved the execution ground to one area that was kind of out of the way. I mean, now it's not out of the way, but back then it was out of the way. And they would do things like move out the people who were being sent to the to, to execution um, very, very, very early in the morning, just as, you know, when, when it was still sem sort of semi-dark. Um, before everyone was up. Um, we know that there are some cases of the rumor mill going round that, you know, prisoners were being moved uh, and people somehow got wind that their husbands and fathers and loved ones were on particular transports. And we do have one or two um, recollections of people running after the trucks and, and screaming hysterically, as you imagine they might well have. But by and large, no, this was sequestered after a couple of mistakes in managing, mistakes, quote unquote, in managing this early. No, this was only whispered about. Um, it was not public. It was not public at all. The whole point was to keep people isolated and atomized and fearful in Taiwan. Um, and if you had a public execution, you would run the risk of, first of all, an uncontrollable crowd. Second, an uncontrollable crowd that very possibly could sympathize with um, the people being executed and then really getting out of control. And even if it didn't get out of control, just sympathetic wails going up um, would be enormously embarrassing for the regime. So, no, this was a regime that did its dirty work out of sight and never, ever publicly acknowledged the numbers of people um, that it victimized in, in these ways until decades, decades and, and changes in government later. We still don't know how many. We, we can take educated guesses, but we still don't know how many. Okay, um, next question. Uh, wow, what a fantastic talk. Such an innovative and productive way to think about governance. Uh, so the question is, it seems like the basic performance styles you have described could be useful in a wider set of institutions 
than just these focused political campaigns. Mm. I wonder if you have any sense or some examples of other sites in which you might see the similar forms of performative pedagogy being used to organize governance. Um, let's see. Um, certainly in um, social movements more generally, any social movement that gets off the ground, and most don't, I mean, most sort of fizzle early and we never really hear about them. But in any social movement that gets off the ground, there is, there, there's inevitably a set of leaders who are working behind the scenes to mobilize. And what they wish to mobilize is commitment and emotion. And so from that perspective, um, we see the mobilization of uh, commitment and emotion from below or from outside uh, regular, the regular channels of governance. This said various kinds of show trials uh, in some ways carry a flavor of these, this kind of uh, performance. So, for example, it, with a similarly revolutionary regime that came into Iraq in 1958, you had in camera um, denunciations and show trials that very clearly, uh, my, uh, my co colleague Charles Tripp wrote about this, um, very clearly, um, prosecutors, revolutionary prosecutors playing to the gallery and extemporizing use, using Arab, um, extemporizing using particular, uh, particularly Arab cultural resonances of poetry and extemporizing on poetry, uh, but using the perpetrators or, you know, the, the people who are being accused. One sees... Um, denunciations and accusatory practices in uh, Stalin's Russia. Sheila Fitzgerald uh, has, uh, has worked on this, and this very clearly was in the interests of the state, of the Stalinist state. One, um, one sees almost perfect imitations of this in Vietnam, in North Vietnam. I mean, to the extent where one kind of needs to ask oneself the degree to which uh, these kinds of practices and this kind of mobilization of by campaign and um, and whipping up the crowd was even any, was was even different in um, North Vietnam and China in the early 1950s because of course the leaders studied in the same places and they, they knew each other quite well um, from old revolutionary days back in the 20s uh, in Guangzhou I mean Ho Chi Minh. And, and uh, Joe and I were very close, evidently. So there are any number of venues, I think, in which one can see um, these kinds of performances. But in, in contemporary times, it is rare, I would argue, it is rare to see regular, the regular institutions of the government and the people in government to actively um, whip up this kind of performance and uh, accusation. One might see it, but I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of an example of this. One sees examples coming more from outside governance with uh, protest movements for example. Uh, but performance is everywhere. The question is under what kinds of conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have uh, ooh, quite, quite a few more questions. Okay, um, next question. Do you consider the KMT regime's decision to allow the publication of the famous photograph of the trial of the Kaohsiung 8 in the late 1970s as a discontinuity from the earlier martial law period where photographs of trials 
as you argue, were not allowed. Uh, and a second part to that question, do you see the PRC strategy moving in the opposite direction over time, where photographs of trials become less accessible? Um, let me think about this. It seems to me that the that with the photographs of the Gaussian 8, one does see a, a change. Um, but part of that might have been because this was a, a very, very large set of street demonstrations um, that couldn't be suppressed. I mean, they, they, it couldn't be kept under wraps. So it might have been a calculated risk um, to come down on the side of the kind of law and order, but have the photographs because everybody knew what had gone on anyway. It wasn't like the prosecution of, quote, subversion that was hidden. So the subversion, quote unquote, was hidden. The prosecution was hidden. The, uh, the actual building of the case and the sentencing also hidden. In the case of an open and very large set of street demonstrations, an open defiance against the regime, you couldn't keep that hidden. So perhaps it was a change in strategy due to the different circumstances. And uh, perhaps it was simply that in the late 1970s, you could not keep this stuff under wraps any longer. Um, particularly uh, in a big set of street demonstrations with lots and lots and lots of people taking photographs. Um, it wasn't instantaneous, you know, there wasn't instantaneous reproduction in the late 70s as there is now on social media, uh, but it was certainly much, much more available and much, much more widespread than would have been the case in the early 1950s. Now, in terms of the photos and the, in the case of the People's Republic of China now, are we seeing a kind of reverse trend? Again, I would say yes and no, it depends. Because on the one hand, um, there is definitely a movement towards greater secrecy and towards the policing of online content. But equally, uh, every couple of years, there's a big, um, anti-crime campaign, a big anti-crime um, campaign slash strike hard campaign. And my memory is that in the last wave of this, that people were executed quite publicly um, as part in, in stadiums, as part of, in, you know, Jiao Yu, you know, instruction. But Jiao Yu is also, uh, you know, it's instruction, it's education, it's entertainment, it's propaganda. Uh, and so these kinds of, it, it, it's, it, it's unclear the degree to which under these kinds of circumstances, the regime would want, at least in the short term, uh, to clamp down on the circulation of these images only when they, quote, get out of hand um, and begin to threaten social order might they wish to do so. So it's a context. I, so it's it's context. I, I suspect that it depends. Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, this is a, a question that I was also thinking about. So thank you, Dr. Strauss, for the timely remark connecting uh, state performance per performativity in the past to the current situation in the U.S. Some Taiwanese are comparing the incident of the sunflower movement in Taiwan, uh, especially from the oppositional side, uh, to what's happening in the U.S. right now. Could you comment to what extent they are comparable, especially in terms of state to people relations? Well, um, I would argue that they are not comparable because I have a very gifted PhD student who's, um, who's just uh, finishing up a, a, a PhD that compares um, uh, social movements, uh, including the sunflower movement in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And so some of this is a little bit fresh in my mind. And what I would argue is in the case of the sunflower movement, what you had was uh, 
delimited occupation, but you also had discipline. You had, and you also had, um, to a very large extent, um, it public, if not uh, enthusiasm for, then sympathy with this. You also had uh, this not being, as near as one could tell, instigated from the top, you know, from the sitting president or indeed anyone in the legislature, at least as I'm recalling the details. So the only way in which it's similar is um, through occupation. Um, and in every other respect that I can think of, it's utterly dissimilar. Uh, the cast of characters engaging in the occupation is different. The leadership is different. Um, the uh, disciplined nature, or at least the relatively disciplined nature, uh, very different. Um, the protracted occupation and the division between those in and those outside the building, very, very different uh, in, in every respect. Um, different. I mean, just sort of take a look at the people who are leading this charge uh, in some of these final images. They are almost exclusively male and white. Um, in the case of this, the people engaging in the occupation in the Sunflower Movement, they were young and students. And I, my memory is uh, lar very large numbers were female. So in, in every respect that you can imagine, <laughs> except for the part of the occupation, um, quote, illegal occupation, uh, very, very different. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I will give you two questions. Okay. Uh, Feel free to either answer one or both, uh, given how much time we have. Um, one is, uh, both questions are very good. One is about your experiences researching these sensitive questions in the PRC in Taiwan. How is the research done? And how would you compare the research experience across the two sites? Uh, the other one was a, um, a second question uh, from an earlier question asker. This is, uh, I wonder if you can say anything about the persistence of previous states as performative regimes, perhaps through the performative habits of the population, either as grassroots performers themselves or as the audience expectations for state performances. Mm, mm, okay. You know, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna take a rain check on the second because that would take ages to try to deconstruct. So instead I'm gonna stick with the easier more, not easier, but more straightforward question. Um, over many years, collecting, 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 and collecting more across different sites with different case studies. Um, and uh, most of uh, the research was done on, on the basis of documents. Uh, sometimes the documents were in published collections. Sometimes the documents were archival. Sometimes the documents were simply reproduced or sometimes there were oral histories that were reproduced uh, in collections. Uh, sometimes it was Wen Shi Zi Liao, but uh, and sometimes it was contemporary press, uh, press from the early 1950s or shortly thereafter. Uh, so I engaged uh, different comparisons. I started off with three different case studies, uh, starting off with terror, um, land reform and actually grain supply. But uh, it was actually very difficult because what I found and what anybody doing comparative work will find is that you can't get comparability of sources almost by definition, even when the topic is the same, the ways in which archives are not just organized now, but created in the first place, very, very different. So. For example, in Taiwan, I actually oddly found open, free, democratic Taiwan to be a more difficult environment in which to collect material, at least initially, 
because in Taiwan, there were none of the intermediary level organizing reports and zongjie that help you make sense out of raw primary data. Whereas in Taiwan, it was either general laws that were meaningless, except as statements of intent, or let or um anjian at such levels of of detail and specificity, but a lot of which was bogus, that you had to kind of you had no way of evaluating what was and wasn't credible as a set of claims because so much of this was just railroaded through on very specious um grounds. So oddly, initially I found it easier to do archival research in authority, the authoritarian People's Republic of China that I did in open democratic, quote unquote, Taiwan. And this was in large part a function of how the archive was, was created in the first place in the early 1950s. And I was very lucky. When I started this research, it was the very, very, the very end of the 1990s and uh, the 2000s when the archives in China, particularly in Shanghai, were at their most open and incredibly open. And so I just collected my socks off. Uh, and what I found was that when I tried to put it together, I didn't, I had so much on grain supply that it was enough basically to be its own book. And I could not make the grain supply case study fit in any way analytically with terror and land reform. Terror and land reform both had a very clear pattern of campaign and bureaucracy and, and grain supply really didn't. And so perhaps at some, at some point I will go back and revisit that. But what I would first say is that oddly, it took, it took several years for the state of archival organization to catch up. There weren't even mulus. Um, for the for the chief archives in um, that I was using in Taiwan. Every time that I went back, they did more Zhongli. <laughs> but initially, you could only search randomly by people's names, but you had to know who was and who wasn't a name that you'd be searching for. And it was, it, I mean, it, it really took about five or six years of literally the state archive administration um, organizing itself uh, and then providing access to even be, a, be able to fruitfully use what had been collected and uh, what became available uh, in Taiwan. And it took me three years of uh, every summer trying to get in to get local access to local records uh, on, uh, on land reform in Taiwan uh, before, before I was Finally, I finally made contact with someone who would say, oh, yeah, I guess we do have that old stuff after all. Yeah, you can come by and take a look at it, no problem. So, you know, there I am going off to Kaohsiung County. Why? Because of the 16 places listed in the Central Register that said that they had archival documents on land reform in the early 1950s, it was the one place that could actually find them. So many archives in Taiwan were cataloged, they were lost, um, they, they were a mess, no one can find them, uh, even now, even now. Now, what has happened since I did the collecting, especially in the last four or five years, is that increasingly in the People's Republic of China, um, it's, it's tragic. Um, because uh, much of what was being declassified in the 2000s is now being reclassified and put off limits. With incre with, for, it starts first with restrictions on Xeroxing, restrictions on Pijun, uh, restrictions on this, restrictions on that. And now much of the stuff that I got um, 10 years ago or more than 10 years or 15 years ago, simply you cannot get at all, I suspect even in Shanghai. So things with archives change over time. So a few takeaways. Things in terms of archives uh, and in terms of materials um, are inherently non-comparable and you have to work very, very hard at doing genuine comparative work. It's very, very difficult. And often, even though you've collected a huge amount, 
you can't make the comparisons that you wanted to make because the sources just aren't comparable and, and you can't make it work. Second is that archives can become more open and we genuinely thought that they would just continue to open uh, and that the People's Republic of China would continue to become more open to the outside world and become a kind of softer version of authoritarianism under the Chinese Communist Party and so on. And that really has not been the case. Um, and uh, we got it very, very wrong. Our expectations were really very, very wrong. And this um, is going to force a lot of, of, of rethinking. And I think this kind of rethinking is necessary without engaging in China bashing. Uh, so archives and political systems can become tighter after they've opened. But similarly, other archives can become more open as political circumstances change and as the resources are put into organizing the archives and making them uh, more accessible uh, in general. So it was a long, long road. <laughs> and this book came out, eh, depending on how you want to count it, ask my husband, two years late, four years late, six years late, eight years late. Mm. But eventually it did come out. So I would encourage people maybe for their second book and not their tenure book to uh, do this kind of work if that's uh, where this, what the spirit moves one to do, but probably not for the first book. Good advice. Well, thank you so much, Professor Strauss. We're now over time. Um, I just want to thank you so much for, for spending Not at all. It was a pleasure. About your book, and it was a pleasure to hear about your book as well. So thank you, everyone, and please join in on our uh, future Taiwan Studies events.